and I now look to Professor Elizabeth Schaefer to close the case for the opposition and indeed the debate as a whole. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to follow that, but um, I just want to point out I'm the only woman speaking. You go, girl. Hey. <laughs> So I think you're absolutely right in what you did. You walked. Some of the speakers walked. I don't know why people have to talk like this. I can see that what's going on. This is like a little globe. This is like the Globe Playhouse stage. I can talk to you and you're seeing something completely different from what you're seeing over there. And that is what Shakespeare wrote for. He wrote for you to see one thing and you to see something else. He wrote for the theatre. He wrote for performance, not on screen, three-dimensional, people all around him. And he wrote for that absolute engagement that you get in theatre, because you don't know what I'm going to do now, because I'm behaving a bit strangely and I'm not standing by that box. I might come and sit on your lap. <laughs> I just want to say to everyone who suffered reading Shakespeare, when Shakespeare died in 1616, a whole load of his plays were not in print because he didn't want you to read them. He wanted you to pay and go to the theatre and to see them. So when he died, Macbeth was not in print. Tempest was not in print. Winter's Tale, Antony and Cleopatra, loads of plays were not in print. He did not want you to read them. He wanted them performed in the Playhouse, and he did want you to pay the money. Actually, I think Kanye and Shakespeare might have had a nice discussion about property portfolios, because they seem to have a bit of a common interest there. Anyway, so, I'm interested in theatre, and if anyone's interested in theatre, you all might have noticed the play that everybody is doing at the moment. It's Julius Caesar. Hmm. Not my favourite of Shakespeare's plays, but you can see how theatre makers, wanting to make a profit, wanting to get people thinking, might think Julius Caesar is quite a good play to do at the moment, that it might be relevant, pertinent, speaking to a current cultural context. This play shows how a monstrous, old, outspoken, bad-tempered, but indubitably remarkable man is assassinated in order to prevent him from becoming emperor, ruler of one of the greatest world powers in history, a power that colonises culturally as well as by brute force. Hmm, I can see why Julius Caesar is the play of the year. Well, Shakespeare, of course, had no thought of Donald Trump when he wrote his play. He was probably thinking more about the experience and challenges of living under the rule of a grumpy, ageing queen. I am referring to Queen Elizabeth. Um, but for me, what is really important about Shakespeare and relevance is that in order to be relevant, in order to hit that relevant button, Shakespeare, although he is dead, has to collaborate with the living. Living editors, living publishers, yes, but most importantly, living theatre makers. These collaborators, particularly these theatre makers, will market Shakespeare as relevant. Of course, they'll say, come and see this play, it's about you, even if it isn't really about you. So are they right? Are they right that Shakespeare is relevant? Well, I think Shakespeare is astonishingly relevant in terms of the politics and the questions that he poses about politics. That's politics in the polis, in government, politics to do with gender, race, refugee, class, any kind of politics. He's posing questions all the time, important questions. But what I think is relevant is it what you think is relevant? Here's me. I'm white, I'm middle-aged, maybe old age to some of you, straight, middle-class woman. Is what I think is relevant? Is that going to be the same as what you think is relevant? Hmm, maybe. Not all of Shakespeare transcends his cultural specificity, and some of it, actually, I could really do without. The ending of The Taming of the Shrew, for example. Unfortunately, that is relevant, but it's just I don't like it. Um, I'll make a confession, the phoenix and the turtle. Oh my God, what is that about? I do not know. But what I thought I would do is just treat you to as a quick sample of moments that I find relevant in Shakespeare and see if you can glimpse any relevance in them. Okay, um, I have to say there's a spoiler alert now because I'm going to talk about some of the endings. I'm sure you know them all. 
Right, number one, Anthony and Cleopatra. This is an example of wordsmithery. Beautiful use of words. Right, Cleopatra has just seen her lover, Anthony, expire in her arms. She responds to this devastating experience by stating that after Anthony's death, there is nothing left remarkable beneath the visiting moon. That speaks to me like a spark of electricity jumping over the centuries. When I'm teaching, I'm always going, oh, well, it was different in Shakespeare's day. A rose didn't look like a rose now because I hadn't been through the agrarian revolution and we've got to remember the difference. But that moment, I'm going, that spark just jumped across 400 years. In grief, in bereavement, it does sometimes seem to me as if there is nothing left remarkable beneath the visiting moon. Okay, example two, Winter's Tale, simple words. Leontes, who for 16 long years has believed his wife, Hermione, has been dead because of his own atrocious behaviour, is suddenly confronted with what appears to be a statue of her coming to life. And he says, oh, she's warm. So simple, so pragmatic but also acknowledging that for some things wordsmithery won't do. Words are not enough. Oh, she, she's warm. Okay, Coriolanus. An absence of words, a silence, or something instead of a word. Coriolanus has spent his entire life pursuing a successful career in the line of business, being a soldier chosen for him by his mother. He has sacrificed everything for this. He is a virtuoso. He's an impressively successful soldier. He's dedicated his life to excelling in the field. And then his mother asks him to throw it all away and in effect commit suicide. He knows that's what she's asking. All that effort, all that hard work, all that sacrifice gone in a moment. And what does he say? He doesn't say anything. He holds her by the hand silent. That for me shows Shakespeare the actor, the player, as well as the great wordsmith. He knows the power of silence and of course there's no such thing as silence in performance as John Cage reminds us. There is only the absence of words or the absence of notes. Listening differently. Here Shakespeare is saying to Richard Burbage, his lead actor, you do this bit, over to you. And Burbage and his successors, everyone who's played Coriolanus ever since, has to embody, has to perform this ambiguous and deeply meaningful silence. And then my fourth example, King Lear. Yes, we had a lot of King Lears last year, didn't we? We had an awful lot of King Lears. But I want to just talk about emotional truth. It's been mentioned before, but for me, Shakespeare offers emotional truth. Lear enters at the end with his daughter, Cordelia, dead in his arms. In the quarto, which is the earlier text, in the final dying speech, there are three nevers. He goes, never, never, never. I'm not an actor, so I'm not going to do it. Never, never, never. That's a challenge to the actor. Shakespeare, who knew what it was to lose his child, his son, his heir, Hamlet, later revised the text and put in five nevers. Maybe Burbage really delivered on those nevers and Shakespeare gave him some more. But for me, that repetition, the word becoming meaningless, says something very important. So, in moments like this, even though Shakespeare wrote for an all-male female, all-male performance environment where males impersonated women, where feminism was not part of the intellectual landscape, I, a woman and a feminist, feel the electricity spark across the centuries. And so I ask you to vote for Shakespeare. <laughs>